open the newspaper or any other media for that matter, many a times we see preposterous statements just thrown around. Things saying that this nation has increased its GDP by so many, so many percent and all the citizens are supposed to be overjoyed because it is indicative of greater job opportunities, productivity and resources. And if that's not a fine indication of a higher quality of life, then what is? So we can say, greater GDP <coughs> equal to better standard of life. In a similar way, we tend to analyze our life and our satisfaction and happiness with it based on similar figures. What is the monthly income into the household? What is the type of shoe that Asta is wearing? What is the type of shoe that I have? Is that Gucci? Is that Prada? I just have Tommy Hilfiger. Um, my bonus was not acceptable this time. Don't even get me started on Abhishek's hike. The thing about these numbers, these metrics, including GDP, is that they do not value the zero priced goods. The zero priced goods are valued as zero assets. If there was an earthquake in a country, a massive earthquake that destroyed all the buildings, and if we build up the infrastructure, the GDP rises. If there was an epidemic and we created a mass public welfare camp, there you go, the GDP rises again. But would any of you all agree <coughs> that these, this destructive earthquake or a viral ailment that torments humanity is actually showing a spike in quality of life? In the same way, don't you think that some of these metrics that we use to measure the standard of our happiness, the standard of our living, a big misrepresentation of our true mental selves? A few years ago, I used to live in Dubai. And one fine summer vacation, to my dismay, my parents dropped me off at my grandmother's remote farmhouse. One whole month all alone with no Wi-Fi, no Xbox, no tasty takeout fast food. I mean, what was I going to do? I missed my fast moving progressive life in Dubai and it made me terribly unhappy and grumpy. I used to sit home indoors at all times, scooped up and even turned a deaf ear to my grandmother's request for a help with the cattle or the fields. I'm not proud to say it, but it's true. Then I met little Gauri. Little Gauri was the girl who used to come to deliver milk at my home. The first time I saw her, she was happily taking the trash out from her home, singing some beautiful tunes. This, due to my boredom, I just one day decided to strike up a conversation with the little girl. And she turned out to be the most pleasant, happy, outgoing, and so full of life. One of those individuals who you cannot forget in just another week or two weeks. And she extended her invitation to her home. And I was surprised by her behavior, but I readily accepted it because I had nothing better to do. So when we reached her home, her father was coming back from a hard day's work. Her two younger brothers were running around mischievously, going to greet their father and grab the package of sweets that he had brought for them from wherever he had come. There was a difference in the spirit in that house. As they all sat down for dinner, to cook, to eat that food, that was rather mediocre in my taste. Not so greatly cooked, not that, there wasn't even like, no luxurious delicacy items, it was very meager and they were just so curious to know my life story. They kept asking me about what life was like in Dubai and what life was like here, how it, how it felt to live in that fake house of my grandmother, which is when I thought back and realized, I never thought that house was big. That cheerfulness and joy of theirs, I had never seen in any of the luxurious streets or flats of Dubai. And it got me thinking, 
I mean, we had a 10 by 15 swimming pool in my flat as well, but they had an endless river. We had switch ACs in all of the rooms, but they had a cool breeze raging in through their windows. The nature of their interactions was so genuine. They were one with nature, and they enjoyed their time together, questioning a random stranger over family dinner. I flew back to Dubai within the week, but I was confused, I was baffled by our modern definition of standard of living and happiness and so on and so forth. So I went through the internet and I searched extensively when I stumbled upon a very intriguing concept, which is what I would like to present to you today as a viable solution for high quality existence. In the far away kingdom, Himalayan kingdom of Bhutan, commonly considered one of the happiest countries in the world, they have devised a metric to calculate the true contentment of their country and their citizens. GNH, Gross National Happiness, is calculated based on nine major domains, including psychological well-being, health, ecology, resilience and diversity, and living standards. Now, you cannot, in the concept of GNH, you cannot just take a wide average. It's like saying, if you get your head stuck in an oven and your feet in a freezer, it doesn't make your uh, average temperature normal. It's like saying, having the lowest positive emotions or a deteriorated health condition is not countered by an increased well-being or an increased house income or